Hello, I'm Park Thi Ng from Singapore. Thank you for inviting me here. Now, COVID-19 has caused great disruption in schooling around the world and, of course, in Singapore. Today, what I'll speak about is the educational changes that took place in Singapore in dealing with the pandemic and the opportunities for future educational change. First, I have to clarify that our system is always a work in progress. So while we have had some success, but like any other system, we still have a lot more challenges than solutions, and we are struggling with many, many things as well. But I'll explain why educational change is so necessary to Singapore and indeed to many other jurisdictions, especially when we seem to be quite successful, at least internationally, that seems to be the impression. <clears throat> Before I tell you the Singapore story, perhaps I should just begin with where Singapore is. Now, just for the next five seconds, could you just stare at the kind of usual map of the world? Could you locate Singapore on the globe? Now, of course, I can't see you and you can't really... So why don't you just try, use your finger and just point, where do you think Singapore is? Five seconds. Could you see Singapore? Okay, actually, Singapore is just a dot on the map. On this map, you probably cannot see unless you really have bionic eyes. So the context, <clears throat> Singapore is actually a very small country near the equator in Southeast Asia, where an island less than 50 kilometers on the longer axis and 40 kilometers on the shorter axis. This is how small Singapore is. We have 5 million people on the small island. Now the airport in Singapore and the airport in Amsterdam are some of the busiest airports in the world. So we run a system of public schools that are funded by the government. Class size is about 35 to 40. So in case you wish to compare Singapore to the Netherlands, okay, the figures are of course just approximations, but it's just for your own interest. So in speaking about educational opportunities in the wake of COVID-19, so I refer to my book, Learning from Singapore, The Power of Paradoxes. Now in this book, I wrote that Singapore is always looking for timely change. It is also hanging on dearly to some timeless constants. Singapore is a land where change and continuity coexist and are equally valued. This, I think, is one of our success factors. Now, the Singapore story is about timely change, timeless constants, even during the current pandemic. We're willing to make changes and we're willing to stick to some very basic principles. So what is timely change, timeless constants? Timely change is about keeping up with the times and staying ahead of the curve. For example, COVID-19 has changed many things and obviously we have to adapt very quickly. But when change is the only constant, one real change is to look for constants that should not change. These timeless constants are beacons necessary for us to stay rooted to our identities as we navigate the turbulent waters of change so that we do not lose ourselves or our sense of mission. So let me start with timely change. Singapore's education seems to be doing quite well, at least from international comparative tests. Then why the need for change? So let's start with that. Well, times have changed and education has to change with the times. In the past, we call it a quotable quote. Today, it is a tweetable tweet. Could someone tweet this, please? Today, we swipe a phone. In the past, we dial a phone. Could you remember? So times have changed. But why change when one is successful? because it is always better to change from a position of strength rather than one of desperation. When we are doing okay, it is actually a good time to change. We can change in a reflective and calibrated manner on a solid footing. If we do not change, we may be forced to change when we are desperate. So what are we trying to change in Singapore? We are trying to move 
from quantity to quality, from a focus on examination results and key performance indicators to a focus on the quality of learning and interaction. In particular, we're emphasizing thinking, appreciation of subject, creativity, engagement, joy of learning, more and different pathways of success, character and citizenship education, student well-being, learning for life rather than for exams, and self-directed, self-regulated learning. Merely as an example, there is a big difference between a child who can play Mozart in the piano exams flawlessly, but hates it, versus a child who truly likes playing Mozart and appreciates music. Which child will eventually be a concert pianist? So this is where my education system is trying to go. Then COVID-19 struck. Now COVID-19 is of course a crisis. The impact on human lives, livelihood, lifestyle has been and continuously tremendous. But as the Chinese equivalent of the word crisis goes, in a crisis, there are dangers, but there are also opportunities. We have been reacting to the dangers, but we could also capitalize on the opportunities if we ask and reflect on the appropriate questions. One of the most obvious change is that we are now much more used to online learning. During our circuit breaker period, which was April to June last year, when home-based learning was implemented in the whole country, that means children were at home, teachers carried on teaching and learning using online learning tools. Now, given the sudden change, schools and teachers really rose to the occasion. Many teachers have learned how to operate tools, some of course more competently than others. They continue to teach, make calls to care for their students, set work for their students to do. They tried their best. Learning continued in the country. So moving forward, these online teaching competencies could very well stick paving the way for pedagogical advancement. Teachers now have a better sense of what technological tools can do and what they cannot provide. This is a great opportunity to evaluate what has worked, what has not, what can work better using an online approach. Online learning has worked during the pandemic because there was no other option. That does not mean that it presents an optimal or sustainable solution for all learners. Therefore, moving forward, we are capitalizing on the fact that teachers are now much more familiar with these tools to move towards blended learning. So some regular home-based learning done online will complement classroom lessons. During such home-based learning periods, students will take charge of their own learning and engage in some topics outside the curriculum. Note that blended learning is not about technology. It is about tapping on technology to help students develop higher capacity for independent learning and learning something beyond what is normally covered in the school curriculum. But to achieve this goal, teachers actually require higher levels of lesson design and facilitative skills. So if home-based learning is not well-designed and facilitated, then for at least some students, that will merely mean free time or confused time at home. So we are seizing this opportunity right now and putting in a lot more effort in helping our students to become better independent learners using a blended approach. But to move towards blended learning, we need to do a lot more to bridge the digital divide. So during circuit breaker, the home-based learning experience was quite uneven among students, depending on family situations. Disadvantaged families did not have computers or enough devices to be shared among the children. Others could not find enough space in their small flat to create a conducive learning environment. So in response to this digital divide, 
the government announced that all secondary school students would receive a personal laptop or tablet for learning by this year. The plan was actually in place before the pandemic happened, but the target date <clears throat> was brought forward by seven years. This is a very positive step, considering the enormous economic challenges that I, my country is facing. But this is a necessary step and only one step out of many. But I think as a country, we are trying very hard in this area and committing resources to leave no child behind. Other than technology and pedagogy, the pandemic has also made us examine the why and what of learning. There are many forces, both local and global, that require us to change our focus from the traditional academic content and qualifications to lifelong learning and deep skills. Now, this is not a new direction, but because of the pandemic, it is now even more important and urgent. The pandemic has given lifelong learning a critical push. We have to do even more to help our students and young people learn for life rather than just simply learn for exams and to be very adaptable. This is currently one of our focal areas in the education system. But the forces are not just about local issues. There are global forces at play. So the point is we have a lot of new things that we have to educate our children about, which are going to affect them more than the traditional learning areas of languages, mathematics, and science. So it's heartening that Singapore has begun work in these areas. For example, sustainability, environmental protection, climate change. These issues are now embedded in the school curriculum in different subject areas. For example, science, social studies, or geography. Some schools require students to research on climate related topics. And we are doing a lot more regarding character and citizenship education and student well-being. As an example, secondary schools now engage students fortnightly on current affairs and sensitive issues, including race, religion, bullying, social media. And more teachers are learning how to engage students and facilitate discussions in context. So let me move on to some of our timeless concerns. We're willing to stick with some basic principles. The pandemic has changed a lot of things. <clears throat> but the mission of education in Singapore has not changed. It is always the mold the future of the nation. Teachers continue to lead, care, and inspire their students. The way to do it may need to change, but the mission has not. There are great things in the education system that we should affirm during our journey of change. So firstly, we do have a robust education system, and we should avoid knee-jerk reactions in reforming it. Today, we are hit by the coronavirus. If we simply react by shifting all education online, tomorrow, we can be hit by a computer virus. So there is time to change quickly, to adapt to changing circumstances. There is also a time to change in a steady, reflective, and balanced manner. COVID-19 is a great disruption, but this is not the only challenge to come. Therefore, we are using this opportunity to construct a robust system for the long-term future and not just solve problems for now. The education system in Singapore today is not the result of a big reform. It is the cumulative effect over 50 plus years of systematic building, upgrading, refurbishing by many ministers, officials, school leaders, teachers, and teacher educators. But in avoiding knee-jerk reactions, we continue in the spirit of timely change. In dealing with COVID-19, we are taking the opportunity to change and to change positively. Let me give you an example about why change, even before problems occur, is so important. Now, this is about the student learning space. The student learning space implemented in 2018 is a national online learning portal that allows teachers to curate and share lesson resources and for students to assess these resources in a self-directed manner. The SLS also provides a common platform for teachers to collaborate across schools. 
and for students to col collaborate in their projects. Of course, the student learning space was not developed as a contingency plan for addressing learning needs during a pandemic. But when COVID-19 struck, the SLS came in really handy for many schools and teachers. Overnight, we could shift to an online learning mode. The point is that we should seek improvement continuously rather than to stagnate. We should change when we are doing okay. Do not wait until we are desperate to change. We have learned that it is important for Singapore to remain in this proactive posture. <clears throat> and we must continue to affirm that teachers, school leaders, and schools are key contributors to our nation's success. Schools matter. They are places for children to learn and to build relationships in a safe environment. School leaders and teachers matter. They are the ones who make school work. So we continue to invest in our teachers. So it's heartening that even when our economy has been hit really hard, teachers have received more support for professional development in line with the National Lifelong Learning Movement for Skills Future so that they can meet the evolving needs of students. Teachers are important to us. Paradoxically, as education become more digitized, teachers are more important than ever before. Microwave oven is good news. This technology gives us hot food in a few minutes, which was unthinkable in the past. But if you go to a high-end restaurant and pay a lot, would you prefer your pizza served out of a microwave oven? Or would you prefer the chef serving your pizza out of a rustic wood fire? So the focus is not on technology. The focus is on the chef. In the hands of a good chef, a tool becomes powerful. In the same way, in the hands of a good teacher, technology enables superior pedagogies for better student learning. So as the internet becomes more important in learning and in our daily lives, knowledgeable and skillful teachers are needed to help students learn how to discern information from misinformation, distinguish relevant and irrelevant information, synthesize and apply information, and practice cyber wellness and cyber ethics. Teachers are important. So the paradox is this. The more we emphasize the importance of computers, the more we emphasize the importance of the human teacher. Therefore, our investment in education is not just to buy equipment. It is to invest in the professional learning of our educators. Just look at the picture for five seconds. Look at it. What do you see? Stare it. In the past, people bend their backs over paddy fields. Today, if we are not careful, we may be bending our backs over microchips. Therefore, in education, we should be masters over microchips, not bending over microchips. We are investing in teachers to learn how to be masters over microchips, over technology. We want our teachers to use technology, not be driven by it. We want our children to learn what technology cannot do rather than do what technology can do. So this is a philosophical constant in our education system since our independence 50 something years ago. In Singapore, education is investment. Investment, not expenditure. We invest to leave no child behind, to help students learn and to help teachers become better educators. COVID-19 may stay for quite a while, but it will eventually go away. However, Singapore's education system must continue to be the bedrock for its nation building journey, one that leads, hopefully, to a more prosperous, gracious, and resilient society. Crises have been a catalyst for change in the past. Singapore always has had the gumption to survive and reinvent itself. My generation turned out okay 
because the previous generation went through the hardships to build the foundation for us. Having benefited from the sacrifice of the previous generation, this generation will carry the burden of change triggered by COVID-19 or otherwise for the benefit of the next generation. In Singapore, education is the human enterprise of paying it forward. And in Singapore, educators are people who plant trees so that others sit under those trees and no one knows who planted those trees in the first place. So let us all appreciate the teachers. So thank you, and I wish you all the best in your own educational change. Thank you.